Well, Rena, we're so excited that you're here. Kay and I are big fans of you. And one thing we talk a lot about on this podcast is stress. Many of us, I mean, I can maybe talk for myself. I definitely feel stress at times. It's something I'm still trying to unwind over the years from my old career. But I'd love to get your perspective around what's the connection between stress and our sexual desire? Yeah. So, I mean, it makes sense, right? When you're stressed about other things, you really don't make room for pleasure or enjoyment or anything really, because you're so preoccupied with thinking about all the other like hundred things you have to do, right? Like go to work. If you have kids, take care of your kids, um, you know, like manage all the other stressors uh, that are going on in life and particularly in midlife, right? When you're in your forties and you're sort of like, or late thirties, you're sort of on your way in your career. You're sort of taking on more leadership roles. You may have small children at home. Um, you yourself as women are going through potentially perimenopause symptoms. And so all those things all together, like can affect your life in many, many ways, but of course it will decrease desire. And there's a clear connection, right? The more stress you have, the less desire you have. And, you know, I, I think we're going to get into it a little later, but there's also, you know, this belief that desire needs to be a certain way, right? Like you see your partner and you're like, oh my God, they're so hot. I want to jump them right now. And that's like not real life, right? Like you've <laughs> been with them. You're not that excited anymore. I mean, like you still get excited, but it's not the same, right? And so, it's sort of like you have to actually connect and make time to connect for the desire to come. Otherwise, it's just not going to come on its own. And so I think that's a big part of it is when you're in long-term relationships, add stress to the mix and the desire just plummets because you're like, well, you're always there. You're always accessible to me. Uh, there's not as much novelty as there used to be. And then you add stress in the mix and you're like, this is the last thing I want to do right now. But I'm so curious, it shouldn't be the last thing that we want to do, right? I mean, you talk about the importance of sexual health. So maybe someone's listening and they're like, man, Rena nailed it. Like, that's how I feel. The last thing I want to do is be with my partner. I just want to go to sleep. Why is it important for us to maybe manage that stress and have a, a healthy sexual relationship or health? Well, there's so much value in intimacy that comes with sex, right? We know that people who have intimate relationships who are sexually active with their partners, they have more marital satisfaction, they live longer. Uh, there's so many benefits to continuing that. But the issue becomes that you're too tired or you're too like, oh, who, the inertia to start is the challenge, right? It's not that you don't enjoy it when you're there. Maybe you don't, and that's a different story. But like, typically it's like, do I really want to like, put all that work in today. I'm kind of tired. I'd rather go to sleep. We'll do it another time. My partner's always there, right? Like I can get them when I'm in the mood. So why do I have to do it right now? And so there is, there's so much value to it, but we often like, especially in women, right? We tend to take care of everyone else before ourselves. So we're taking care of our parents. We're taking care of our kids. We're taking care of our, in my case, my patients, like whatever it is, you put everyone else before you take care of yourself. And I take care of women in my practice and they'll have leakage or prolapse and they'll be dealing with it for no joke, 40 years. Wow. And they'll finally come see me. And it's the, we don't give ourselves priority. So whether it's, yeah, I want to have sex, it's just not going to be a priority because it's not mandatory to get through the day. Right. And so it should absolutely be a priority. It should absolutely be something that we want to keep that connection and fire alive, but we don't. And part of it is society, right? We don't talk about sex. We only see sex in a certain way with young, very attractive people having sex. And, and so your mind just thinks, well, people are not having as much sex. Of course, it's not a big deal because we just don't talk about it. Like people who are married 30, 40 years are not talking about their active sex lives, but they should be right. And how much value it brings to them day to day. You just sort of forget how good it feels to be active with your partner. I'm curious, if you typically see more of the physical block of I'm lacking sexual desire or not the physical block, the mental block, I'm lacking sexual desire. I just don't have the energy. I don't have the motivation or people coming and saying, I just don't physically get aroused. And like, what's the difference between those two? It's definitely both. And in women, it's very uh, multifactorial. So arousal, right, is you get lubricated, your nipples feel erect, like your body feels that tingly sensation, like, oh, I kind of feel it in my core that I want to have sex or I'm feeling horny, right? Whereas desire is a thought, right? It's something that we think and we feel like, oh, I want that. 
And so the, the typical thing we see is that people think I have desire and then I have arousal and then I have sex, but that's not always how it happens. Right. But in general, people can have a lot of desire and difficulty with arousal or people can have um, difficulty with, we don't see as much difficulty with arousal by itself. Uh, We do see difficulty. People say like, oh, I have difficulty getting lubricated, whether it's with medications or due to hormonal changes. Uh, But ultimately there's less arousal disorder, not to say that there's none, but we see a lot more desire disorders. And I would say that they they are medical sometimes, and sometimes they are um, they are mental. But it's usually a combination, right? Because you get stressed, you think you're something's wrong with you, you think you're broken because you don't have sexual desire, and so it becomes a mental problem, even if the initial thought or the initial issue was not medical. And I was watching um, a video with you, and I remember being in a women's circle, and everybody was kind of going around openly sharing about their experience with orgasm, and probably about 90% of the women in the room at that point had said that they never experienced an orgasm or they hadn't experienced an orgasm until way later in life, maybe even have after having multiple serious partners. So what is the role of stress play in our ability to orgasm or not orgasm? Yeah. So one, that's a lot of people to not orgasm. The, mm-hmm. And the number we generally quote is like 12% of women never have an orgasm. That's still too high in my mind, right? If you think about it, like when men have sex, first time sexual encounter, 95% of them orgasm. Whereas with women, it's like 45%. So there's a huge gap. But in terms of, um, you know, seeing uh, issues with orgasm and how often we see it and how often it's mental, um, Orgasm is a completely mindful event. You have during an orgasm, your brain literally cannot think of anything else. Like you can't think about your kids, you can't think about the work you have to do, nothing. And so if you are stressed out, you can't be mindful enough to appreciate the advances or the foreplay or the other things that are really necessary to reach that mindful state of orgasm, right? And so if you're stressed, you can't think about orgasm. You can't focus on the pleasure you're feeling or your partner's trying to deliver. And so it can become very, very difficult. Now, of course, there are medical changes, right? Like there can be loss of sensation with age. There can be hormonal changes that can affect the ability to, um, you know, derive the same sort of pleasure from the same stimulation you used to have. But ultimately, um, stress is a huge one, right? Especially for women. We see it more often. I think men are more able to be mindful and present in the act, whereas women are not. And I'm curious, I mean, you see patients day to day and you mentioned, you know, stress is such a pivotal aspect that you see often. What are some things that you recommend to them that you've seen actually help? Because it's easy to be like, all right, don't be stressed. But any tactical things that you've seen have helped people really increase that desire? Yeah, you know, I think everyone is different. And so I give them uh, ideas, but ultimately they have to figure out what works for them in reducing stress. I often say meditation is really easy to do five minutes a day. It doesn't feel like it's doing anything in the beginning, but like you can start Mm -hmm. super easy, get an app, like do a few minutes a day. Taking a bath can be very luxurious and it can help in a lot of different ways. Like if you have pelvic floor dysfunction, I often tell people I like prescribe them 20 minute bath every day because it helps relax the muscles too. Um, Wow. So I think, you know, ultimately deciding what that is for you, for some people, it's exercise. For some people, it's, um, you know, it's uh, it's spending time with family and friends or being outdoors, but deciding what that is and making sure it's a productive stress reliever, like it's not scrolling your phone, it's not binging Netflix or whatever, because those things don't actually cause stress relief. And there's actually like six things that we know break the stress loop based on evidence. And the most effective one is exercise. And this is from Emily Nagoski. She wrote a book on burnout, but most effective is exercise 20 minutes. Um, Mm -hmm. Another one is actually hugging somebody for uh, 20 seconds. So like standing on your own center of gravity and hugging someone for 20 seconds, kissing someone for six seconds. Um, And that is, if you're not like in the moment can seem awkwardly long. Um, And then uh, having interaction with people. So like, no, it tells your brain that you're like in a safe space. So having positive social interaction. So even if it's like the barista at Starbucks or whatever, just having social interaction and then having creativity like dancing or singing or, or drawing or whatever it is, those are all really productive ways to break stress loops. 
You mentioned pelvic floor, which is something I really didn't even start thinking about until I got pregnant. And then in my postpartum years, there's a lot of emphasis on your pelvic floor. So what is a pelvic floor and why does it matter? It's not just for women who are pregnant or postpartum. It's for everybody to think about. So let's talk about it. Absolutely. So pelvic floor is like a bowl of muscles that um, sits underneath our, in our pelvis, right? It holds up our bladders, our vaginas, our uterus, our rectum, right? And so it has multiple functions. It stabilizes your body. So when you step, when you walk, you have stability. It helps hold up all those organs. It helps the function of those organs. So when you urinate, when you defecate, those pelvic floor, the pelvic floor muscles are relaxing. It's involved in sex. So when you have an orgasm, that muscle spasms um, and also needs to relax to allow a phallus or toy or whatever it is into the vagina. So it has a multitude of functions and you can actually get muscular dysfunction. And the way I describe it to people is, you know, people get TMJ, they get like the clenching of their jaw and they do it at night. They don't even know they're doing it. They wake up in the morning with headaches. And it's the same thing. You don't know that your pelvic floor is tense or tight, but it can happen. And then you can have issues like you're going to the bathroom all the time. You're having constipation. You're having lower back pain. You're having pain with sex. Um, and it can happen in men too. They can have all of those symptoms. They can also have pain with sex or pain with erections, pain with ejaculation. Um, and then it can become weak. So the thing that we hear more about is when the pelvic floor becomes weak after childbirth or after having babies, and then you can have leakage of urine um, and that can be very distressing. It's very, very common, but that doesn't mean it's normal. It just means that the pelvic floor is weak, causing you to have leakage. Like when you do any stressful activity, like coughing, sneezing, jumping jumping on a trampoline, exercising. Um, and so it's, it's super important to keep your pelvic floor functioning normally, which means that it squeezes when it needs to squeeze, relaxes when it needs to relax, um, and also to avoid either side of the dysfunction, whether it's too weak or too tight, which people can happen either from stress or also from overdoing Kegel exercises, like doing too many and not relaxing in between. So if somebody suspects that they might have a pelvic floor issue, what are the best steps for them to take? So it's important to get evaluated by either a urologist, a gynecologist, or a pelvic floor physical therapist who can do an exam and assess, is it truly your pelvic floor or is it something else, right? And if there is weakness or tenseness or whatever, to then see a pelvic floor physical therapist that can help work with you. It's just like a personal trainer, right? You can go to the gym by yourself and do exercises, or you can get a personal trainer. Same thing with physical therapy. You can try to do Kegels by yourself. A lot of the times you might not have the perfect form. You might clench your abdomen muscles. You might clench your gluteal muscles, which you're not supposed to do. And, and then, you know, you may not get the same efficacy, but when you go to a pelvic floor physical therapist, they work with you and they have tools to see one, are you doing it correctly? And two, are you seeing progress? And that's and for both ways, whether it's relaxing the pelvic floor where you don't want to do Kegels or it's strengthening the pelvic floor and you do want to incorporate Kegels as part of your strengthening routine. It's it's amazing. I mean, it's the pelvic floor is such a prominent aspect for a woman's body, but no one talks about it. Like literally I was with a girlfriend. I think the first time I heard about it was two years ago. She's like, she had a baby and she's like, I am just peeing all the time, a cough. She's like, no one talks about this. No one talks about the importance of a pelvic floor. So I'm glad we're bringing this up because like you both have mentioned, it's more than even what it's like after having a baby. Um, it, it's part of just so many different functions. And I heard you in another interview saying something around the impact of sitting too long during the day and its correlation to pelvic health or your pelvic floor. So tell us more about what you mean by that. Yeah. So when you're sitting all day, right, you're not moving your pelvic floor muscles appropriately. You're not stretching them. You're not lengthening them. So they become short and they don't, they don't, relax or become as elastic anymore. And so that can lead to pelvic floor dysfunction. So during COVID, a lot of us urologists saw so many people coming in with urgency, frequency, um, erectile dysfunction, pain with sex, like all sorts of things. And it was because people were sitting all day long because they no longer had to go to the office and they weren't, they hadn't yet adapted to like, oh, I got to take a break and walk around or things that we've sort of, I think, accommodated to now that we've gotten used to having home offices and doing all these things. Um, and so, you know, it was like a big rush of these people and they were sending them all to pelvic floor physical therapy to sort wow. of relearn how to relax those muscles. But really, 
walking daily, like doing the normal activities of daily living is, is helpful. And when you're sitting all day, you're not, you're not getting them. We talked about pelvic floor dysfunction as a source of painful sex. What are some other causes of painful sex, particularly for women? Yeah, so painful sex, uh, commonly, a very common one is inadequate lubrication. So we often, like, guys will be like, oh, she's so wet, it's so great. Like, your wetness or your lubrication does not always correlate with how aroused you are. And that can be due to genetics, that can be due to medications you're on, that can be to hormones, right? All of these things can affect the amount of lubrication you make. And so it's important, and I think it's super easy to use a lubricant, right? Use a lubricant, make sure things are slippery, make sure things are comfortable. Um, and there's different kinds of lubricants, right? There's water-based lubricants. And I think people don't realize you have to reapply those. They dry out. They're just water, right? They evaporate. Um, but they work great. They're super cheap. Um, you want to pick one that has the least amount of preservatives and stuff in it because it, it can cause sensitivities. Um, Silicone-based lasts longer, so they're a little more slippery. You don't have to reapply, uh, but you don't want to use them with your silicone sex toys. And then oil-based lubricants are also long-lasting. Um, you can't use them with condoms. You can even use like coconut oil, you know, based ones and olive oil-based ones. Um, and they, they work great, but you don't want to use them with condoms because they can break down condoms. So there's a whole host of different kinds. And I often encourage my patients to just try different ones, like ask for samples. Like there's plenty of companies that will send you samples so you can figure out which one you like. Um, and then, you know, the other thing is inadequate, um, time for foreplay. So during sex, the vagina prepares itself for sex. The vagina lengthens and elongates. It almost doubles in size to accommodate the phallus. And the cervix moves up and out of the way. And so if your cervix hasn't had time to move up out of the way, some people will have really pain with deep full penetration. And so it's important to make sure like some people, yeah, it's great. They get aroused really quickly. Their body gets ready really fast, but some people don't. And so it's important to sort of communicate that with your partner that maybe a quickie needs a little more time for me to get there. And how do hormonal changes impact like painful sex or more dryness? Because we've kind of seen at Be At Our Company, people who are on birth control can feel it or even women in perimenopause, menopause and postmenopause. So what's happening in our bodies where it's alluding to more painful sex for them? Yes. And in in low in lactation. So when you're breastfeeding, you can also see this. Um, and with certain medications like antidepressants, all of these can affect the amount of estrogen that you have in your body, particularly in the vaginal tissues. And so when you decrease estrogen, it will actually decrease the amount of lubrication you make. And so um, it is sort of very, very common. And in fact, using uh, specifically postmenopausal, but also in women who have uh, on birth control or lactating using vaginal estrogen is a very safe and easy way to increase lubrication. You can also try moisturizers. Um, they're like hyaluronic acid base. It's just like lotion, right? Mm. You put it on your face to keep it youthful. You put it on your vagina to keep it youthful. I love it. Well, I want to talk about shift gears a little bit and talk about masturbation. I know you know all the benefits and studies, but share with our audience, you know, what are some of the benefits that come with masturbating? Yes. So the benefits that we talk about are related to the climax, right? The orgasm that you have associated with masturbating. And for some people, I think people get really worked up about masturbation because they're like, oh, no, it should be with a partner or this or that. But ultimately, some people just don't have access to a partner, right? They This is the only way they're going to get orgasms. And, and there's many people who masturbate and have normal, healthy lives. So I think that's really important to start by saying, because there's a lot of naysayers who are like, oh, you should never masturbate. And I think it gets lumped in with, you know, problematic pornography use, which is pretty rare. Um, and when that happens, yes, masturbation, if you're only masturbating with pornography, you're only masturbating the same way every time, people get really worked up about it. But ultimately, there's so many benefits to one achieving orgasm and to understanding your body, particularly for women, like everyone is so different. So realizing what sort of stimulation allows you to achieve climax. And you mentioned earlier how so many women didn't have climax until later in life. And that's because most women haven't figured out how to climax, right? They, they experiment, they don't masturbate as much as men do in terms of um, the statistics. And so they don't 
tend to figure out what is the stimulation they need to reach climax, which is often in the large majority clitoral stimulation. And men aren't taught this either. So they're not stimulating the clitoris unless, you know, they've learned that from somewhere. And so ultimately, um, it, a lot of it relies on self-exploration. And so there's, there's benefit to self-exploration because one, you can tell your partner what you like when you're with them. Two, you can achieve climax efficiently and easily. And there's so many benefits to that, right? So when you have orgasms, we know that it decreases blood pressure. It actually, there's studies that shows that it improves immunity. It reduces pain. So there's studies that have shown that there's reduction in pain during menstruation or pain during labor with um, orgasm. So there's many, many benefits. And of course, the, um, the like overall feeling of well-being after you have an orgasm and better sleep. So ultimately, there's there's plenty of benefits to it. And certainly, as long as you're masturbating and reaching orgasm, and it's not becoming a problem where you're doing it all the time and not going to work or like avoiding other things, right? Because you want to masturbate, then it's not a problem. And really, that's such a small subset of the population that has a problem with it, that really it's safe and healthy. And it's completely the ultimate form of safe sex, right? You don't have to worry about getting an STD or anything. So um, I think it's great and wonderful way for people to learn about their bodies. That's a great explanation. And um, I even remember you on Drew's podcast talking about the benefits of specifically prostate health and masturbation. And there was like a really interesting study there. Are there similarities in terms of vaginal health? And are there any studies on that looking at masturbation? So, you know, in terms of vaginal health, the, the thing that people will sometimes quote is like, use it or lose it. You need to have sex to maintain vaginal health. And I think that's, you know, not necessary. What you need is good blood flow to the organs, right? And so men and women have nocturnal erections. Men have visible nocturnal erections and women's clitorises engorge and fill with blood. They're the same exact tissue anatomically. If you cut open a clitoris and you cut open a penis, they look the same. Um, And so- and they're embryologically formed from the exact same tissues. So when you're when you're undifferentiated, you're not a boy or a girl in a fetus, it's the same tissue that then goes on to form the penis that goes on to form the clitoris. And so really the best thing is to continue having blood flow to those areas. Now, in order to do that, you can masturbate. You can also maintain a healthy lifestyle. So exercise, um, don't get diabetes, don't get high blood pressure. Those things will affect blood flow to the genitals, which have really small arteries, right? And so they will be affected first before you see heart disease or other things. We call it the canary in the coal mine. So when men show up with erectile dysfunction, we say, check your cholesterol, check your diabetes, check your heart, make sure you don't have anything else going on that's silent behind all of this. And I'm I'm switching gears now, but we did source some questions from our community members. And one question that we got was, what if a couple is experiencing a mismatch in sexual desire? What are their options? How do you work with them? Yes, this is a great question. And I will say like probably... 90% of couples experience mismatch and desire at some point in their relationship. So what that means is someone has higher desire, someone has lower desire. Now, who's the one to blame, right? Neither person. It's not a person issue. Very often, the person with low desire gets blamed, but it's a relationship issue. It's we need to find desire. We need to find a way to match our desires. Now, it's not always a problem. Like I said, 90 plus percent of people probably have mismatched desire, but a lot of people figure out ways around it, right? People will masturbate. People will find other ways to alleviate that desire and still be in a committed, healthy, wonderful relationship with their partner. But oftentimes it can create quite a bit of discontent or miscontent with the partners. And so there's a few things that we tell people to try and do. And one of them is to schedule time for intimacy. And a lot of people are like, I hate it. It gives me stress. I don't want to do this. This doesn't sound fun. This doesn't sound sexy. But like when we need to work out, we put it on the calendar. When we want to meet our friends for brunch, we put it on the calendar. When we were young and we used to date, right? We would say, hey, I'm going to meet you Friday night. And you would the whole week be so excited to see your partner, right? You'd be like, I got to get ready. I got to shave my legs. I got to do all these things. I have to look great. I got a new outfit. Like you would spend so much time and planning for that date, knowing that you might have sex, right? And you'd get really excited when you see each other, you'd be so excited, like, oh my God, we're finally going to do it, right? And um, 
And now we don't have that excitement, right? So actually scheduling time for intimacy and not specifically sex because that puts pressure, right? If you say we're going to have mm-hmm. sex and say like you're not in the mood or say your partner has performance issues, assuming you're in a heterosexual relationship, like either way, you know, it, it's, it's, it then sets you up for failure, but saying like, okay, we're going to be intimate instead of going out for dinner, we're going to lie together. We're going to snuggle. We're going to, um, you know, touch each other. Maybe we'll take our clothes off uh, and see where it goes, right? Maybe we'll explore each other's bodies. Maybe we'll try something new and exciting. If sex happens, great. But that is not the goal. The goal is to enjoy each other, to be intimate with each other. Not like when you come home bloated after dinner, like before, like make it a priority, right? The things that that we care about, we make a priority. I always say like, if you had a leak in your in your house, you'd make that a priority, right? You'd go fix it. Even if you said, I don't have time, you have time for the things that matter. So make time for sex or intimacy, sorry. Yeah, I love that. It's almost like taking the pressure off is just the thing that that couple might need. Um, and maybe the pressure is coming from one partner or the other, but I, I love that advice. That's great. Yeah. And just figuring out like a time, right? Like if somebody wants sex every day, the other person wants it every week, maybe like twice a week, you set aside this time and it's somewhere in the middle, right? And realizing you're never going to be in sync a hundred percent of the time. Yeah. I love that. I'm all, I love the scheduling aspect because also mentally, like you mentioned in your earlier years, like you mentally prepare for it. Like especially as women, like you said, we're so busy with our careers, whether you have kids or whatnot. So it's nice to kind of mentally get in that space versus just like impromptu. So I love, love that example. Another thing that we hear quite about from our audience is testosterone. So I'd love to hear why, you know, why is testosterone so important in women and what happens to testosterone as we get older? Yes. Great question. So testosterone is actually in more abundance in the female body than estrogen. So we actually have more testosterone than we do estrogen. And testosterone has a whole host of functions, but one of the most common ones is desire. And so as you age, particularly through menopause, there's a pretty significant drop in testosterone because your ovaries stop functioning. And a lot of testosterone is made in the ovaries as well as the adrenal glands. And um, that still continues to to be produced, but it does decrease. So very often people will have this decline in desire. There's not a ton of studies on testosterone in women, but certainly in the specifically about desire, we see a lot of studies on it. And it's actually very, very useful to replace testosterone in women who are struggling with low desire, postmenopausal women. Um, And you can check testosterone levels. Essentially, they should be about a tenth of the level of a man, right? So you're trying to replace to that level. And uh, what's generally accepted is to use like a topical cream, a tenth of a of the amount of a, that a male gets and you put it like on the back of the calf and rub it in. Um, and so you can see benefit with that. Now, testosterone in general has benefits for bone health and other things too that hasn't been studied in women to that rigorous degree. But certainly we know that it's an important hormone for a lot of different factors and can be very helpful in in replacing that. And particularly in in my area of expertise, one of the causes of painful sex is vestibulodynia. So the vestibule is an area that's right outside the vagina, between the vagina and the vulva and the labia. And it's very hormonally sensitive to both estrogen and testosterone. So another place I'll often use estrogen and testosterone cream is when people have sensitivity in that area on their exam. And that can actually be a cause of pain. And then replacing that testosterone through a topical cream in that specific area can actually improve those symptoms. Um, So there's a a whole host of benefits, but those are probably the most commonly ones that we do replace testosterone for. Yeah. And, and I'm curious, are there, and, and maybe there are not, are there lifestyle tips or things that women can do to increase their testosterone levels? Or is it typically that they can consider maybe hormone replacement therapy? Yeah, so absolutely. So the same sort of lifestyle tips that we give men will apply to women. And those are uh, making sure that you are getting good resistance training. So lifting heavy with um, the large muscle groups of the body, because that shows shows to improve uh, testosterone levels, getting good quality sleep. So that means avoiding caffeine and alcohol uh, too close to bedtime if you can, um, avoiding blue lights, trying to make your environment really dark, um, having good 
kind of sleep at the same time, wake up at the same time. I love giving this advice and I'm like the worst sleeper, but um, really? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we're working on it, but, <laughs> but um, you know, like, uh, and then um, also, so diet wise, there's not a, like, there's not a clear diet that has been studied as rigorously as the Mediterranean diet. So generally eating plants, vegetables, good sources of healthy fats, getting a good amount of protein in your diet and fiber and avoiding processed foods and um, like simple carbohydrates is all going to be good for testosterone. And then avoiding BPAs. So trying to eliminate like any sort of endocrine disrupting chemicals. So trying to drink from plastic water bottles. I mean, plastic is everywhere in our environment, but like really trying to minimize that exposure um, can be helpful. I love it all these like lifestyle tips just help everything like every hormone like going back to the basics which it sounds simple but you know even you were very transparent about your sleep like we're all still trying to dial it in more but i love that you know there's so many things that are easily accessible for us to trial when it comes to supporting our hormones so love that yeah and crazy about the plastics because i don't know if you guys just saw that study that came out on monday that plastic water bottles are actually way more toxic we already knew they were toxic but yeah. they're like way more toxic than we thought they were they contain tons of nanoparticles which are super scary because they can cross our blood brain barrier they can cross the placenta they can get into our organs so fresh on my mind that plastic water bottles are probably a no-no <laughs> I know. And people think they're doing something good by drinking a water bottle instead of drinking from the tap. But it's like, no, just the plastic in the, that's holding the water is so dangerous. And um, I even worry about like the plastics that are on the, you know, you get a metal water bottle that has a plastic lid or like a plastic yeah. straw. And you're like, I don't know about that, you know? Um, so remains to be seen. The other one last tip I will say is, um, you know, testosterone is on a circadian rhythm. So it, we release more in the morning, less in the evening, but in order to get that good boost in the morning, it's good to like tell your brain it's the morning. So, you know, people talk about sunlight, but the other benefit of getting sunlight during the day is getting your body to know that it's morning and get that testosterone boost. And then in the evening, going out and seeing the dusk. So your body knows, okay, it's time to go to sleep. It will help you sleep better, improve your sleep quality. Um, and then that in and of itself improves your hormones. That's great. We also work with a lot of women who are struggling with PMS and PMDD. Have you seen a connection between women who are struggling with these types of things and um, sexual dysfunction or just challenges when it comes to sex? Yeah, so there's not a ton of research in this area, but there's been studies that have shown correlations between people who have these conditions and sexual dysfunction anywhere from like 50%, 70%. They're not perfect studies, right? But the thought is that maybe they have concomitant issues like they maybe they have pelvic floor dysfunction certainly when you're having the pms episode very likely your pelvic floor is tense and it's not relaxing because it's dealing with all this pain and then you're going to have more sexual dysfunction um so there's probably and there's probably hormonal changes too that go along with it they're not very well delineated yet but i wouldn't be surprised um you know like for example during the first day of your period, right? Your estrogen's at its lowest. And we know that pain sensitivity is higher when you have low estrogen levels. So there's sort of all these um, correlates that probably just haven't been well studied because women don't get studied as much in the literature as men, unfortunately. Hopefully that will change. Um, yeah. But, you know, there's just less data on women. Yeah, this is just, this is an ad now for anybody <laughs> listening. Please study women. <laughs> <laughs> I know, seriously. And another question we get a lot, and I'm actually curious, um, what are the top causes when it comes to UTIs? It's interesting. As I kind of look back on my own health journey in college, I would get them all the time. And I'm like, what was going on with my body? Sometimes it would even lead to kidney infection. I don't know if that's correlated, but what are the main reasons that people get chronic UTIs? Yes. So UTIs are um, so, so common and so debilitating. Like people are like, oh, it's just a UTI. But like when you're getting them all the time, it is literally the worst. People are like, I can't, ever, I'm afraid to have sex. I don't want to do anything. Am I dirty? Like there's so much fear around UTIs and shame. And I just yeah. want to say that it's not because you're dirty. Like, <laughs> like uh, anyone listening who has recurrent UTIs, you are not dirty. You are not wiping wrong. You are perfectly healthy. Um, it is not your fault that you're getting recurrent UTIs, we have to figure out what's causing it, right? And so the common things we tell people are like drink lots of fluids, right? Let's try to flush out that bacteria. Um, dehydration is a cause. Some people do get it 
from sex, uh, but they're not getting it because of they're getting it from their partner. That's also a big misconception I see. They're actually getting it because of the motion, right? The motion of thrusting is causing bacteria from the vagina to get into the urethra uh, and from the rectum to get into the vagina, into the urethra, and then causing infections. And because women have a shorter urethra than men, all that, any bacteria that comes from the rectum and somehow gets in your vagina and gets in your urethra can cause infection. But after you've had the first one, right, why do you keep getting them? We don't know exactly why, but likely there is either a problem with the microbiome that's causing maybe change in your vaginal pH um, or a change in the lactobacilli in the environment, or we think there might be like quiescent bacterial reservoirs that some people get in their bladder that cause recurrent infections. But either way, there are things that can help prevent UTIs uh, that are evidence-based. Now, you can go online and see all sorts of things, like what works, what doesn't. And so the first thing I always tell people is drink lots of fluids. The second one um, that we tell people is make sure you're not constipated. If you're constipated, you will get recurrent UTIs. So getting, making sure that you're like, having regular bowel movements, um, clearing those things out is super important. And then um, you can also try cranberry supplements. So cranberry supplements, uh, the juice itself usually doesn't work because it doesn't have some of the concentrated ingredient that you need, and it's usually full of sugar. So you need 36 milligrams of proanthocyanidins in a soluble form for it to work. And there's actually good evidence that it does work. And so uh, what it does is it binds to the bacteria so that it doesn't stick to the bladder wall and then you pee it out. Um, you can also get them, like I said, with sex. So sometimes you can do um, just one dose of antibiotic after sex to prevent it, or you can do two doses of cranberry on the day of sex and the day after. That's not as evidence-based, but some people are like, I don't want to take antibiotics. Okay, try that. Um, and then there's data on... Uh, Things like D mannose. There's a little bit of data there that's pretty good on two grams of D mannose a day. Um, and then methanamine is another prescription you can get from your doctor. These are all sort of preventative measures. If you are in a low estrogen state or postmenopausal, then vaginal estrogen is actually probably the best treatment for prevention of recurrent UTIs. And the issue is that you actually need to check the vaginal pH to make sure that one, you're applying it right, and two, that it's working correctly. So I usually test everyone's pH when they come see me that first day. And then three months later to make sure what are they putting in, you know, are they doing it correctly? Is it working? Maybe they need it more often. Maybe they, because not everyone's the same. Like we just write prescriptions like, okay, you're good. But to see that it's actually getting absorbed and working, right? Um, and so that's really important to make sure that you're actually seeing the benefit of it. Um, and so I think that likely it's a combination of uh, you're at risk because there's some something we don't know yet, right? Immune wise that we don't know why you keep getting getting them. But then, um, you know, there's some maybe some microbiome imbalance or pH imbalance. And again, still kind of figuring that out. But those are the things that seem to help the most. And of course, getting evaluated to make sure there's no other source. So like a kidney stone, um, your bladder's not empty. I see it a lot in people who like are nurses or teachers who never pee, yeah. like they like they just never go to the bathroom. They work like eight hours and they're like, oh, I didn't go to the bathroom um, because either they don't have someone to cover them or they're just too busy. And then your bladder starts becoming less functional. So they're not emptying their bladder as regularly. And then it stops squeezing as strongly. So you wanna make sure there's no functional abnormality, there's no kidney stone, um, and then kind of try these other recurrent, uh, these other sort of preventative measures, um, which can be very effective. Wow. I'm mind blown right now. I literally during that time period, yeah, it was college and I would just sit and study. And I remember holding my pee, which is like the crazy thing. I would never do that now. And I was like, oh, I'll just hold it. No big deal. And I for sure was not drinking enough water. So makes a lot of sense, but that's so fascinating. <laughs> and it's so interesting to me because when a lot, I've heard that story over and over again of women saying, when I was in college, I used huh. to get UTIs all, all the time. And I'm like, what is it about? I mean, obviously, like, it could be multiple things. Like, what is it about our college years that we're contributing to? Chronic yeah, we don't want to use public toilets. People don't want to use public toilets. <laughs> and now I'm, like, so paranoid because of college. Like, I'm like, oh, I, want, I, I need to make sure everything's clean. But it's interesting that you said that's, like, a misconception, you know, yeah. the dirt yeah. aspect. <laughs> and, and the other thing, people are hovering over public toilets. So when you hover, right, you don't want to sit on the toilet, your pelvic floor is not relaxing. So you're not emptying your pelvic floor. Uh, you're not emptying your bladder because the pelvic floor is not completely relaxed. And so people often, the young women who come 
moms see me with recurrent UTIs will often have pelvic floor dysfunction for a variety of reasons. Stress, maybe they're hovering, maybe they're new having sex and that's creating some stress in their lives, whatever it is. But that's very, very common in young women is that they have pelvic floor dysfunction. They finally get to see the pelvic floor therapist. They learn how to relax their muscles. No UTIs go away. Oh yeah. Hovering left and right in college. Like <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> um, we talked a little bit about some of the changes that happen in perimenopause, but it's very common for women to experience changes in their libido, which can be, you know, not only tough on their relationship, but just tough on their own mental health and what they're going through. So what are some other things that women can do at this stage of their life to support their sexual health? Yeah, I mean, I think as soon as you have symptoms, go see your doctor to get evaluated. And, you know, there's it's it's difficult because some doctors who uh, you'll see don't really understand that those hormone levels can fluctuate quite a bit during perimenopause. It's sort of like the wild, wild west during perimenopause. You can have high estrogen, you can have low estrogen. I mean, everything can come at you, but symptoms are symptoms, right? So we can treat symptoms um, with, with hormone therapy as needed and sort of like working together to figure out what's going to benefit you most. Um, and, you know, realizing like, give yourself grace. Like this is a time that everyone goes through in their life. It lasts for years. So people can have 10 years of symptoms around the, the time of menopause, and then they can continue to develop symptoms of genitourinary syndrome of menopause that progress over a lifetime. So they can have dryness, they can get recurrent UTIs, they can get um, pain with sex. And that's all because the tissues down there are changing. So during menopause, your labia will actually um, get smaller, like they'll actually shrink and your tissues will thin your urethra gets, gets the tissues from the urethra to the vagina thin. So you're actually closer to the vaginal opening in terms of your urethra shortening. So there's so many changes that occur. Your lubrication decreases that we've talked about. Um, and these all can affect like your overall well being. the feeling like I don't, it doesn't feel good to have sex. Right. Um, and so I think ultimately it's like, don't ignore your feelings. This is a time that your whole body changes. And in fact, there's so much data that if you start hormone replacement therapy earlier, like within the first 10 years, you're going to have lower risk of cardiovascular disease, lower mortality, like almost up to like 30 to 40% reduced mortality. So you're dying less often. Um, there's so many benefits to it for bone health. I mean, like excellent bone health and maintaining muscle mass, maybe some mood mood stabilization, brain brain health. Like there's so many benefits to it. So I think really talk about it with your doctor, talk about the risks and benefits, but there's just so much value to like maintaining good hormones. Like we didn't, people didn't live to their hundreds, you know, when like, like, like a hundred years ago, things have changed and we need to evolve and let people yeah. live their best life. Yeah. I, I feel that a lot of people think hormone replacement is so scary, but what's also scary, I was talking to another, uh, another doctor about this is she was saying so many people are concerned about breast cancer and stuff like that. Well, women also have a very increased risk of Alzheimer's and dementia when their estrogen drops. So actually like Alzheimer's and dementia is affecting more women than it does men right now, which is really interesting. And that comes with all of these hormonal changes that happen. So I just love that practitioners are talking more and more about uh, hormone replacement therapy, doing it safely, finding the right practitioner, because there can be so many benefits that come with it. Like you said, our cardiovascular health, our brain health, our sleep, our libido, so many things. Yeah. And in terms of bone health, women are more likely to get hip fractures than men. And when you get a hip fracture, your risk of dying within that first year is 20%. So getting your bone health, I mean, like it's actually FDA approved for bone health, for osteoporosis prevention. Um, so above and beyond anything else, like that's super important. And of course, brain health is important, but not everyone's going to get dementia, but everyone's bones will age. Every single person's bones are going to age. And if you don't want to fall and break your hip and then deal with the consequences of that, I mean, as a physician, when we were, when I was practicing in the hospital, when you saw somebody yeah. fall, you were like, that's it. They're never going to go back to the functioning the way they used to. They're never like, unless they're super motivated, right? Mm -hmm. Most people are going to, their whole life is going to change. They might not even be able to go back to the home they had before, right? They may have to go to assisted living. I mean, there's, it's dramatic how much it changes your life. And um, I think like, if you can prevent it with hormones, like talk to your doctor, it's not as scary as it seems. There's been a lot of misinterpretation of the data, particularly with the breast cancer risk. It's really, really low, especially when you're using like transdermal products. Um, 
So really there is a risk, of course, with stroke. There's There are risks with hormone therapy, but it's not as overinflated as people made it seem because of this misinterpretation of the Women's Health Initiative that occurred like, you know, many years ago and has kind of propagated for so, so much time. That's going to be so reassuring. We get so many questions, Rena, on can you talk more about hormone replacement therapy? Should I do it? Should I not do it? So this is this is amazing. And I'm sure it's just going to help so many people. So thank you for that. Yeah. And I think knowing that there's so many different formulations of hormone replacement. So if something doesn't work for you, like it's okay. We have gels, we have injections, we have pills, we have like topical um, patches, right? There's so many options and vaginal hormones, like so, so safe and very little risk with them. So like, there's so many options that we can find something that works for you. And a lot of people also get upset when they've had breast cancer, but if you are no longer actively having breast cancer, it's absolutely safe to do vaginal hormones. And I think soon we will see that it is safe to do systemic hormones, because we are in men giving testosterone to men who've had prostate cancer, right? So similarly, you know, after a period of time when they're uh, no longer having concern that their cancer is going to recur, very similarly, I think we'll see the same in women. Yeah, that's so interesting because, you know, my mom, when she went through her breast cancer, she was on estrogen lowering medication for a while. It had a lot of repercussions. It was necessary at the time, but she actually developed osteopenia, um, you know, after going through that treatment. So I always do wonder, and it's something that I want to look into for her because there are those repercussions there. Um, I want to end on a note for anybody who's listening to this and they just want some simple tips to improve their sex lives on a day-to-day -day basis. Maybe they're just not feeling themselves lately. What are some things that we can do every day to ultimately improve our sex lives? Well, I think when it's with your partner, the number one thing that will improve your sex life is talk to them. Talk to them about sex. Like, make it in a place where you're not going to offend them, right? Don't do it in the bedroom. Don't do it right after sex, but like literally talk to them. Like I actually got an email today about somebody who's coming up with this product that like partners can put in their desires and it makes like a, a product for them. And I was like, Oh, that's so interesting. Like, but do we need a product now? Like we can't just talk to our <laughs> partners. <laughs> like we should be able to like sit at the kitchen table or go for a walk or get in the car and have a conversation about like, what turns you on? What, what would be fun for you? What would you like to try that we haven't done? Like actually having those conversations and realizing that it's not going to just be one conversation. You're going to have to get over the awkwardness of talking about sex, because guess what? We never were taught to talk about sex. We probably haven't talked about sex our whole life. So to be like, Hey, is this okay? Are you happy with this? Like I see guys all the time too, who are like, Oh, I don't last long enough. I'm like, does your wife care? And they're like, Oh, I don't, I don't know. And I'm like, she may not care because if she's, if she's having orgasms from clitoral stimulation, then how long you last during P uh, vaginal penetration may not really be a huge factor. And so like talk to your partner about it, right? So I think the number one thing you can do is rip off that bandaid, start having the awkward conversation and build up to it and don't get offended, right? Like they may be like, what the, f what are you talking about? Like, why are you bringing this up? And don't get offended. They just feel awkward and they're just like having a reaction to it, um, but be committed to that. And I think that's super important. And then in general, just like make yourself a priority, right? If something doesn't feel right or like you're not sure, talk about it, talk to your doctor, talk to your friends. Like we don't really talk about this with our friends enough, I think even. So just like bring it up, talk about it. You might find something that helps. Even you can go into like a, a novelty store and just be like, Hey, like, you know, like, do you have anything that might make this more fun or might make this more comfortable? And they have so many things. Like I'll give you an example. Some people who can't um, who have trouble with deep penetration, you can buy this product called Onut that you can put on the penis that actually reduces the length of the penis that penetrates. Um, so for some women, that's actually really comfortable, right? Because they're like, man, my partner's too well endowed. It's too uncomfortable for me. And this may be helpful. So there's lots of things out there that may be helpful for you if you're having issues. Rena, you are a wealth of knowledge. Thank you for joining us. We'll definitely include all your YouTube, your socials, your website, so everybody can follow along because you're amazing. But thank you for joining us today. That was so much fun. And quick question, if anybody wants to learn more about you or if they want to work with you, are you? is your clinic taking patients? How does that all work? 
Yes, so my clinic is in Newport Beach. We're actually opening a second location in Beverly Hills. So we'll be in Newport and Beverly Hills. Um, I, you can make an appointment super easy online. Go to my website, renamalikmd.com slash appointments. Um, so you can make an appointment there super easy. I'm also on social media. So if you just want to follow me, I make content all the time. I have a podcast as well. Um, I have a YouTube channel. So it's Rena Malik MD everywhere you can find me. Amazing. So helpful. And again, like you said, this does not need to be taboo. I'm so glad we're talking about these conversations. I hope that they will continue. And thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.